<laughs> so, uh, as we are reaching to our end, we have the last talk uh, for uh, the whole conference. Uh, for the end, I left this talk on purpose, actually. It's, the title is uh, Getting Involved More. So, uh, I think we should have some discussions since we are, many of us are are here in this room now, we can have a discussion on how to improve our uh, recruitment process and stuff like that, and uh, those guys uh, know a bunch about that stuff, since they either recruited or mentored a lot of people. Uh, so I think it will be uh, very interesting. So I'm giving the microphone now to Thomas, and uh, Thomas and Marcus uh, will explain about the recruitment process. Okay, so getting involved more, more in Gen2. Uh, this presentation is separated two parts. First, Marcos will explain how our recruitment works, and then I will show some examples how to actually contribute, how to write e-birds, e-classes, and whatever else, with some good practice ideas. Uh, so, first of all, we slightly messed up our presentation uh, lookup-wise, so I will have to, after we do this presentation and Marcos at home, uh, fix up the tech, tech file and upload a new PDF, so now we have two files, so don't get, get surprised when we alt start between two open windows. And let's get rolling. So first, where am I? I am a council member, I work in KD team, I was silently pushed there, not by myself, and I maintain library office e and handle the office stack we have in Gen2. Formerly, I also worked on X11, overlays, clustering, QA, and various fancy stuff. And now I will give my word to t Marcos so he can introduce himself and start with the uh, recruiting process. Hello. Um, my name is Marcos. You also know me as Horang Horang. What do you mean? Okay. Better? So, again, I'm Marcos, also known as Horang for most of you. Uh, I'm a Gen2 developer for almost four years now, and I'm involved in quite a few teams since then. So, today I'm going to talk about the recruitment part of my role. Um, what is it? Hi there, here. Yep. So, most of you already know that recruitment is like a painful, long process. Uh, we can actually split it in four steps, five. Uh, first, and I think this is the hardest part, you need to find a mentor with a lot of free time. A mentor is responsible for uh, educate you and learn and teach you about the basic stuff. I mean, like how to cooperate with others and how to write basics, he builds. And uh, after that, you need to start working on the quizzes. The first one, they build quizzes pretty straightforward. There are some basic organizational questions and, and some simple technical ones. But uh, the next one, the end quiz is pretty hard. So you actually need to um, be part of the community for quite a while so you can actually be able to answer all the questions successfully. Um, once your mentor judges you are ready, he will open a bag for you, saying, okay, I think this guy is looking good, so please uh, make him a developer. So one of us, one of the recruiters, uh, will pick him up and then start doing the series of interviews. This the entire process lasts for about, well, the best case is like a month. The worst case is like a year, depends on how active you are or how much free time you have. Uh, so, what you get as a developer? First, you get access to the portage, which is like the most important thing. Uh, you get to push your own packages there instead of working in an overlay or a private overlay. Um, you also get uh, email address, it's cool. Uh, you get the chance to work with uh, quite a few experienced people in this area, uh, depending on your team, obviously. Uh, you also get to know new people, like we are doing right now. And uh, finally, we have like good flames in our mailing list. For example, we have like uh, system D thread every week. 
Um, so uh, it's important to improve this process because, uh, let's face it, like waiting two or three months to get access is not optimal. Uh, we tried uh, a couple of years ago to create a web application. This was part of the Google Summer of Code. Uh, it didn't work as good as we expected, uh, probably because of the design of the web application and because we don't have a dedicated maintainer for that. Uh, so we reverted back a month ago to the old process, like doing the quizzes again. So I was thinking about maybe we can use some Google infrastructure for that, like using Google Docs to between the mentor and the recruit, so they can uh, work on the quizzes together. Because right now the recruit has to send the quizzes to the mentor, the mentor has to do the fixes and then send the he built the quizzes back. So I guess like a shared Google document would go better. Uh, the recruitment interviews are are done in the IRC network. So like typing and chatting for like two hours, it's uh, it takes long, so maybe we can use like uh, Google Hangouts or um, Skype or whatever to do like an actual interview face to face, like face to face. Uh, but if you have any other ideas, I mean, from your own experience, how we can improve things, then tell me. <laughs> so here are some statistics from our uh, recruitment bags. Uh, like five years ago, we see that we had about 30 people who wanted to become developers, out of which uh, 28, I guess, uh, 24 managed to do it. Uh, and since then, there is a steady decline. Until today, we have like uh, seven, ooh, 20 people, actually, I think it's 18 people, uh, and uh, only um, 15 of them managed to do it. Uh, I don't want to go into details, I mean, what happened and we have like this decline over the years. I'm actually going to focus on the uh, people who didn't manage to do it. That's not because uh, we cut them off. The main reason is that the process took uh, that long that they got demotivated or they got busy in the meantime. So they decided, okay, I give up. I don't, I'm not interested anymore. This is a problem, actually. Like losing four people because of your bad process is a problem. So, in case you're wondering that you may not have the time to become a developer because the more you get involved, the less, the more time you have to contribute. Uh, there is another way to help us. Um, so, the despite our uh, shows like how many packages uh, are in the Porta tree without the maintainer. That means they get a lot, a lot uh, more and more bugs daily and nobody is actually doing anything for it. So until recently, we didn't have a way to manage that, but we formed a team called the Proxy Maintainers, where um, a small group of us, around seven people, are taking care of these packages, provided there is a user who actually contributes the patches and fixes the bugs. So if you have like a package that uh, has no maintainer and you like it and you want to maintain it, then contact us, say, okay, I want this package to remain in the tree, so I'm interested in fixing it and maintaining it myself, and one of us will help you push your fixes to the portal tree. Um, yep, yeah. what else? Um, another way to help us is through art te and hair testers. Uh, so art testers are people uh, using their own machines to help the actual architectures mark packages stable. So because uh, there are different use flags and different combination of dependencies uh, versions, we can't test everything ourselves. So we have dedicated people doing the work for us and then they report back to us saying, okay, test this package, it looks good, please mark it stable for me. And we actually, it actually works pretty well so far. And some of the teams do have hard testers, um, people who do similar stuff for large um, um, quantities of packages, probably. Uh, I know QD and Chrome do have some like that. LXD have a couple of people. 
Um, and by actually doing some, what is it? Yeah, and if the hair testers are doing their work well, there is less work for um, art testers. Uh, so here are some basic ways you can help us. For example, uh, the first one is a slightly outdated page saying this team needs a person doing that. I'm not sure if uh, the actual projects are using it. I try to use it. I don't know about the others. And uh, the second link is about the packages that have no maintainer. So if you click that, you'll get a list of, of about uh, 550 packages without a maintainer. Pick one and then contact us. Um, of course, there are other ways. You can actually submit patches to the open box and then you help the actual maintainer push the fix much faster. Um, if you actually want to help us, but you don't know exactly what you want to do, then that's not a problem. Just send us an email saying, I want to help you where I can help. I'm interested in PHP or Java, and then we'll again get in touch with the respective teams. Uh, yeah, that's it for me. Yeah. Okay, so that was for the how to get a became a contributor. Now let's take a look how actually contribute something to Forge and to with regards to creating packages and stuff like that. So I plan to show up uh, various e and explain stuff how it's supposed to be done and I will also show one issue in one package and we will speak about how to fix it. Uh, yeah, here am I. So let's connect to some Gen2 box. That was fast, surprising. So I wrote there net DNS knot. Net DNS knot. So let's go to the top. So this is basically Gen2 e build uh, cookbook how to create some package. We have some EAP, which is API of the desi desired package. You should always pick the latest one, apart from a few picked Gen2 developers who don't like it. Uh, then uh, you have to include some scripts that run your functions, like eutils here, which handles patches and various messages to user, and auto tools, probably for the auto configuring auto tools package. Then you need to specify description, home page, source, pa uh, source where to fetch from, and license. Uh, license is is important one because I noticed most of the contributors get it wrong. So ensure your package has correct license. It makes life easier for lots of people who likes to comply to the licenses. Then we have a slot, which is uh, something extra over the version, which allows you to split the itself package itself into various categories. Let's say you have KD3 and KD4. So you set KD3 for slot 3. So you can only install the slot 3, and you don't have to update for KD4. Uh, and the same for KD4, where you set slot 4, and you ensure you don't get the KD3. Uh, this is not that useful for user to manage the package, but more easier for the dependencies. Because uh, you can have, for let's say, 3 or 4 slots for various libraries, and some packages work only with some of those. Keywords, another important one. Uh, always when you have some package, it can work only on selected architectures you tested it on. So for this one, it's e written by me and touched by anyone else. And it's you, or it was only tested on AMD64 and x86. Technically, I could test it myself on PPC and PPC64 as I have access to our Gen2 server with it. But s since the library is well was not used there and nobody showed up interest for it, I was not keyboarding it. So basically when you are contributing eBuild, keep the keyword list only for the pick, for the architectures you were actually testing it. Then we have some dependent EUs. Oh, that's the important one. That's the most fancy feature we tend to have. It's the possibility to do optional stuff. Like here we have debug, but in di various different examples we will have, there are multiple use flags like CAPS support or zero conf settings and similar stuff. So you can disable or enable those. Uh, 
Uh, here you have to, have to ensure both ways works. So if you enable that use flag and disable the use flag, the package must work. Not that you use, uh, add the use flag for, let's say, here is debug, so test it with debug on, so it actually compiles. Nothing makes people unhappy more than trying a new package and finding out debug doesn't work or well, debug is not that important, but we can <laughs> find more interesting pieces. Uh, the greatest issue with uh, broken use flag is a conditional patch. It means you apply the patch only under some specified condition, let's say, if user is using UDISC2, then apply this patch to make it work. And surprisingly, developers try only the default subset, so suddenly the tree is broken and nobody knows why. So. Now, the dependencies. They are sp currently split to two phases, but we have nice talk on mailing list to make only one dependency string for it, which I s kinda like, but back to this. So, rdepend is standing for runtime dependencies, and it's only runtime dependencies, so you don't need those during compile time, unless you specify it on the depend line, as it's over there, depend equals rdepend. And then there are some depend-only dependencies, which means they are not populated for the binary packages. Like, for example, package config is mostly no use for you on binary package unless you make something that actu actually use package config on runtime. So then we have a phases. There is not much of them in this. That's why I picked this e build up because it's easy. It's using the auto tools. So we have here some patch. That's why we call the e utils. Uh, so we move something to m move pit file to var something, I suppose. Don't care. It seems to apply. Then we do some set to configure AC. We remove VR. Um, VR is a nice feature of. Auto tools uh, that allows you to stop uh, your compilation on any error located in your C files. But there is a slight problem that developers usually do not compile with our use flags and crazy setups, which means we get the warnings which transfer to years. So for this, we need to e auto reconf as auto tools required. That's nothing to do with our case. And then we have to configure the source itself. Is done in the configure phase, surprisingly. So there we call some, uh, set some variables, disable link time optimizations, uh, enable some feature, crazily enable the debug. This line was provided to me by upstream, so that explains why it's so lengthy and interesting, contrary to normal debug debug. And then we do some install. Uh, the default is a Actually, uh, meaning that we call the default portage function for the phase. Uh, portage has a defined function for each phase. So basically, if you would need uh, only an econf, like configure my package and didn't have any options, you can just omit the whole function, delete it everything, and it will it will work. And for the src install, we do the default and install the init file. Init file is what we use in OpenRC to have our nice daemons running, like for the bint, disk not, Apache, oh, what, is, what else we have, SSH, and whatever else. Other people install systemd files. OK. And for post, post inst, it means f phase in post installation is uh, using a new feature from EAP4. Well, it's not new feature since, since EAP4 is now surpassed by EAP5, but nothing in Portage is yet using EAP5, I suppose. So if there are, let me think about the condition. Oh, yeah. If there is some installed version of CNOT DNS package, it shows up this e-info message that says the user to recompile the zones so he doesn't mess up his setup. So I suppose the eBot itself is pretty easy to read. It's nice TXT file. It's not long. If you take a look at long, at the end, uh, it's long 62 lines. Not much lines actually overspan the 80 lines, which is at the 1.1 mark or up on top of the command. So if you take a look, we have only one overflowing, and it's the debug one, surprisingly. So it's pretty easy to write those things up. So 
That's for the simply built. Now let's take a look on bit complex stuff. Uh, in there is the issue in. The you found something there. Okay, then tell me. We can fix them right away. It's CVS. Yeah, give him the speaker. Who is it? On the top, it's running down right now. Uh, well, uh, replacing versions could also be the same version if you're just remerging the thing. So you're always using it. You need to be looking basically what the values there are. And you probably want e-log instead of e-info in the package postings as well. Well, that's a good point because this one is printed only to the uh, console and e-log is locked to the files. Okay, we can replace it. So e-log, log. I should have probably said it too late. Okay, so now we are logging. And do you uh, remember the syntax uh, for the replace by? Um, replacing uh, versions uh, could be multiple, but like if you added something like uh, it doesn't match PBR, that's uh, I guess. If it's only single slot, a slot, it'll be only a single value. But replacing versions is all right, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to look for all the occurrences. Uh, yeah, if I'm correct. Yeah, uh, but yeah, sim simple like that. Uh, That's you, why don't you all, I think you always have replacing versions in uh, yeah, Not yeah. really, if you are installing from a new. Yeah, a new one, yeah. So your re-emerges re won't get detected that way. Yes. So you'd have to test. And so like maybe we uh, don't have any syntax for this because all yeah, e-builds are using only this condition for now. So maybe we need to figure out something. Yeah, it should be e-classed anyway, but. Huh? <laughs> in replacing versions is space delimited just of of atoms and the atoms are not they're all just like CPVs can't you just be like use has be like is this e build CPV in replacing versions and if it's not then oh. we're changing versions and if it is in replacing versions then I don't know what exactly you do there like why would replacing versions have more than one version in it I don't know how it works with slots okay you may have to I'm not sure about these slots either. If it's no, no, way. I don't know what this is. I mean, I, has will say is okay. string in list. So, so we could say if replacing, it has replacing versions PVR, but then what happens with slots? I don't really know what to do. Okay. I'm not sure either. So I have a good idea. So how about anyone who is watching this presentation or sitting here opens a bug and finds a solution? That works for you? That doesn't motivate me at all, no. <laughs> And we can give them something nice like you should email Dev and make sure to CC Zach. Yes. Okay. I will ask Zach. So we changed only the uh, the commentary, but I will commit it anyway, just for the fun. This is how Gentoo Developer works. <laughs> Every one will do it for my. It does. Take a look. Wait a bit. See, change log done, committing, and <laughs> and we are using GPG keys sometimes. <laughs> Ouch. Anyone remember econ? Anyone remember econ default values? It looked pretty default to me, but. Um, th those, were, those were not in the econ default values okay. because I was redefining the var path and stuff like that to not be var lib but var lib package <coughs> name and stuff like that. So uh, here I'm only opening the KD libs e build, showing up uh, nested, dep uh, nested dependencies which are slightly cons complex. So you can see that if we are not using Aqua, which means ne which means we are not using prefix on Apple on Mac, uh, we need some X11 libs. Then if we are not using the Sanos kernel, which is I don't know what something prefixy, then we need to depend on one of these packages. So the syntax is pretty straightforward, I would say. Everything is explained in div manual. And here is something fancy about this e-build. In 
src configure. Let's take a look on the if condition there. If you zero conf, uh, it uh, checks if we have some version of Avahi, then enables Avahi. Avahi. Otherwise, it complies that we don't have Avahi. And in the else case, if we are not using zero conf, it just disables Avahi. And if you take a look for zero conf usage in a whole e-build, it's some posting message which is wrong. Okay. It already depends on the zero conf. So basically, this whole idea somehow checks if dependency in a depend is satisfied and then does something which is completely wrong, right? So what do you think? Is it correct or not? This is mostly for developers, this one. <laughs> But since I'm showing it up, it's obviously not correct. <laughs> so the problem here is already fixed, so I will show the diff. <laughs> it didn't fit on the screen, okay. Uh. Less one. Less is new more. Okay, now we have it. So as you can see, the only switch that was changing was Avahi. So it was moved under the zero confuse flag down there. Uh, the last add line and basically the whole insane conditional was removed. So please don't invent your own logic for handling use flags. Rather use the default options we have and we provide for each build system you have. You can have RAF, uh, auto tools, CMake, do we actually support BAM? I am not sure yet, but we support scones and stuff like that. Everything has conditionals and it handles them perfectly, perfectly well without issues. Kill, kill, okay, that works. So now for the breakage, I should have opened Bugzilla here. Yes. So we have a bug in Acroid, which is an ugly binary PDF reader, which is mostly known for opening your uh, documents with formulas, like filling up some survey for government, because they like to send you the PDF with forms, and also for all the security holes it has every month. So here's a bug. After each install, it shows you some message which is annoying like hell every time you install the package. So, as you can see, there is a code example for it. If we are using NS plugin, every time it asks for the NS plugin wrapper. So, how to work, work around this? Any ideas, suggestions? <laughs> it's, all, it, it's written there? Yeah. Oh, I didn't notice that when I was looking at the bugzilla. <laughs> okay. So, I, will, I won't do this commit <laughs> since I hoped to do it as an example, but I did a commit before for the e -log message, so I won't be fixing this, this one right away. So, this was one of the few bugs I had opened. Let me take a look if we have something else here. Uh. Uh, oh. If you complain about the amount of the bugs opened for the printing, there is nobody handling printing since the Dilfridge is busy with his real life. So we have nobody in general handling printing, just for you to know. Uh, okay. So let's move to the bit different area. What? What? You, you don't like the E-class? Okay. Not really. Uh, I crashed this laptop uh, like four times during this conference, so... Oh, it's running Sabayon, if you're interested. Mm -hmm. So, this is a JIT2 E-class. Stuff I wrote uh, as replacement for JIT1 E-class, which surprisingly handles JIT repositories and live e -builds. And we will show here how such E-class looks. The basic for E class is to write comments everywhere. 
as you can see, the light blue stuff is commentary. So it's, let me just first skip through it fast. You see light blue is the winning color. No, well, here is uh, some code. But other than that, you get quite few comments all over the place. So always describe as much as you can what the hell is your e-class doing and not just expect us to read it because we are lazy to read. So, each e-class has export functions, which means uh, functions which we are overriding over the default. As I showed in the Knot e-build, there was some call to default function. Uh, this gets overridden when you inherit some e-class included and it has export function. More and more stuff. Is it not? It's not. I didn't hear you from the speakers. Now it's on. The mm -hmm. default function calls only back to the package manager default. It doesn't follow the uh, E-class intelligence chains as far as I remember. Hmm. Yeah, that's why I was calling it in the e build because I wanted to ensure that the default is called and not something from, let's say, base E-class and stuff like that. Yeah, but it doesn't have anything to do with export functions. Default is portage function? No. Nope. Yeah. Oh, well, you said. Export functions tells you what functions that equals exports. Yeah, and we, uh, those export functions override the default, yeah. basically. Yes. Basically, yes, from the point of view. Yeah, but you don't call. You don't call the functions itself. It's got yeah, yeah, yeah. If you, if you omit the function in the e-build, then the e-class function gets called. But if you call default, like from not, then you get the portage default, not the mm -hmm. e-class default. Okay, okay. yes. From, from within the e-build, if you call default, it doesn't mean the latest default from your e-class, but the default from the portage. This is how you meant it. Okay. Yeah. So you have to always declare uh, the function you actually want to call when you override the face. Well, like if you specify for this e-class src unpack, you have to call JIT-2 underscore src underscore unpack. And Greek is getting unhappy here. So let's move a bit forward. <laughs> okay. So we specify shitload of variables here. Uh, which are usually describing some description, what it does, what's the default value, boring stuff. Let's skip it. And then we have uh, multiple internal function, as you see, internal. It means it's supposed not to be called from within the e-build. Actually, whatever is marked internal, you can call it anyway. But at least it's uh, not, it's shown as internal in the uh, man page, which, we, which I will show a bit later on. So, the call itself contains some debug print function, which is something like putting debug log to your image log, or not, not to your image log, but to the log, di log directory when you are compiling. It prints nice what's happening here and there. So it provides ease debugging information for your package. Then we define some default values. And then the rest of the stuff is actually Lots and lo lots of debug print and few lines of raw bash calls or bash conditions. Actually, I've seen only one complex thing in this E-class. And let me find it. Oh, yes. This is the ugliest code we have in the E-class. And surprisingly, the only stuff it does, it prints nice information of what CV, what JIT3 you cloned, what revision, and what, what commit you are at, uh, and branch, and whatever else. And this is the ugliest part of the E-class. Oh, well, maybe even this eval might be evil, but eval is nice. Everyone likes eval. Okay, that's for the easy class. As you can see, then we defined the SRC unpack and called all the internal functions from we wrote above, whatever they do. And then print, again, nice information message. Always inform a user about what you are, what the hell are you doing. Nobody is really happy when you remove his home directory and don't tell him, rather tell him, oh, by accident, I just removed your home directory. Hope you are happy and stuff like that. 
Okay. Then there is a SRC uh, hack for SRC UI, I, as I can see, that's a new one. And I only can wonder why it calls unpack for EAP 0 and 1. Anyone has idea? This is actually not code committed by me or, or anymore, so what could be the reason here? It should be. It's for unpack, so it should be in e Ah, it's, oh, it's going SRC unpack. Ah, ah, now I see. Okay, that makes sense. Good point. So that was for the easy class, and now for the ugly class. Oh, no, 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 I can't explain Python E-class, sorry, because uh, I'm on the same level of mental stability, not on the RFU mental stability. <laughs> okay, so here we have a nice function I wrote. Use me now, without almost no commentary. Do you like it? Uh, actually, if you compare the use me now and use me now inverted, uh, there is only one differential. See the echo on and off, echo on and off. If you go down, there is echo off and echo on switched. <laughs> yes, it should be one function, but I was too lazy back then, and surprisingly, in three years, nobody bothered to fix it. So, as you can see, there is also lots of uh, weird functions that define only one variable. They are used for the use flux switching. It's boring stuff. And then we do all the magic to make uh, CMake files from various upstreams to comply with uh, Gen 2 configurations. We remove all definition of build types, core make files, prefixes, verbosity and everything like that and let users specify it. And also the next step is to uh, include some stuff like our compiler and everything so it's not hard coded. Most of the CMake stuff is hard coded to GCC so you won't have any luck with Clunk unless you would use uh, this E class and set your default compiler to Clunk and stuff like that. Well, uh, here is a more of these uh, such settings. As you can see, you have to set all the crazy stuff for build systems. That's also not so interesting when you write a new E classes, unless you get unlucky with weird build systems. And in that case, I would recommend you to consider the Gen 2 Dev and pray for no flame. So, as I said, you have to set almost everything down there. Wow. And then you finally can call the CMake, which is done here. CMake binary, com, some arguments, and build it. So that's how our E classes work. So that should be about the E builds and E classes. So now, a bit of the QA of your E builds. Why and how you should use Ableman? Basically, you, th there is no question. Oh, I removed the when when I was reading it. I had I had there previously when, why, and how. So when I wanted to say always. Okay, why? Why you should use Ableman? It scans your rebuilds and uh, tells you your your own issues you could introduce to the package, like typos, uh, long descriptions, weird useful like mismatches, and stuff like that. So always fix all the issues if you can to ensure it pass overall QA. And basically, I suppose proxy maintainers won't accept your e-build if it has any issues in the repoman command, apart from jobs overriding, which happens often, which is for the mirrors, mirrors and warnings can be in ignored, mostly. You don't like that idea? Well, it's a warning. Uh, my write maybe should be fixed, not must be fixed, but 
okay, better than ignored. You might try to fix them, but if it's too much work, like you are writing simple e-build with 20 lines and suddenly you find out that you would be fixing two hours this problem, just push it like it is. Uh, and never use force command on repo command if you are a developer and you want to push something to the tree. Uh, actually, even uh, on KDE team, sometimes people force the commit of KDE based stuff and they thought they checked everything and to ease their time they used force for the commit and they missed some architectures so they broke up the stable tree. So never ever use force unless you really, really have to. So now I would like to ask Marcos to come here and we will have a discussion about it. Well, well, links, boring. Okay, questions. So now we have discussion about the recruitment and QA. So go for it, guys. Any questions for any of us? But come on, put your hands up. Why can't we use the recruiting web app? Why can't we use the recruiting web app? You said, why? Uh, because of the design, I guess. It's not really helpful. There is no, the, the way it's designed, it's uh, one page for each question. So you have to go back and forth all the time, checking the questions and then. Mm, yeah, but the, the thing is that uh, if we don't use the web application, since I mentor many people about three at the same time, always for the last three years. The thing is that if we don't have such a web application, I have to play with paste pins and emails and IRC logs and it's not convenient at all. I have to yeah, but that's your problem, but our I problem is that we don't have a maintainer for the application. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, but I'm spending with a, with a mentee months while we spend three days. And if we calculate hours, yeah, but you we spend about it. six hours, and I spent months with a mentee. I don't object to that, but if you find us a maintainer for the web application, then we can start using it again. Um, so basically, we should have a usability guy, not an, uh, not a, uh, under the hood hacker doing the uh, UI things for yeah. it, and that would make a big difference. Yeah. So our problem is that we get a lot of reports from mentors saying mm, it doesn't work really well, well, this should be fixed, that should be fixed, but we have nobody fixing it. So it doesn't work it at the moment. If anyone likes Rails and usability, there is an easy way to contribute to that one. So basically what, what is Marco saying, we need web developers, guys. So if you are a guy who can write web applications, basically, basically the front ends, Please, don't hesitate, become a gentle developer. You don't have to have access to CVS3 to work on the e-builds, but we also need people who likes to do web pages and create a nice stuff, for sure. Yeah, uh, we are web developers. So, uh, is, this, is the web app still alive? Yeah. Can we see it? Can we yeah. see the problems? Yeah, we, we are still using it for art testing and chart testers, but not for developers. Sorry? Uh, I hope it's up. I hope that too. <laughs> Let's see if I have login. So, go back a step. Let's go back. This is go back. Now so we have. Okay, we have like one. Uh, if you click, these are the questions for the tough staff quiz. So if you click on any of them, uh, a new page is coming up. So you check this answer. Then you have to go back. Then you have to go forward to the next question, back and forth all the time. I don't really see the point, to be honest. It's bit painful. I, I, I'd rather read the text, the, the e-build quiz. That's much easier for me. Jungle. Say jungle. Ruby. 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 Ruby
No, it's not Java. It's uh, Rails uh, 2.3 with uh, some uh, interesting framework on top of it. But um, should one of the things to do would be to port it forward if someone is interested in just Rails porting. So thank you guys. And the event has reached to an end. Did you like it? <laughs> <laughs>